In the name of the one true God. Amen. Mark begins his gospel by saying the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. For all the oddness of starting Advent 1 last week with endings of things and second comings, today we can finally start getting ready for the birth of Jesus. Or not. There is still nothing about a baby, no journey to Bethlehem, no angels, no silent night. For Mark, it would seem that all the excitement of the season is irrelevant to the grand story of Jesus the Messiah. The Gospel of Mark is interested in the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. So he begins not with his birth, but with something of a challenge to the reader to watch, to get ready for a powerful thing or someone that is coming. This is not just the beginning of the story, it's the beginning of everything. But what does that look like? What does everything look like? We don't specifically focus on the baby Jesus being born, if we don't specifically focus on the baby Jesus being born, but look at it from waiting for Christ to come again kind of like we did last week, then what are we looking for? I think we want ourselves to be loved and saved. I think when it comes down to it, those two things really are the things that we care about, the things that matter. We want someone to love us, and we want someone to come and save us. And we also kind of want the bad guys to get their just rewards. This has been true forever. <clears throat> it is still true today. We are so deeply divided on so many things. We want to win, and we want to have the bad guy lose. Sometimes we want the bad guy to lose really big. We do this in sports. We do it in politics. We do it in our own social circles. And if you say you don't, you're not being honest. This is also the same in Christianity. It is justified by a vengeful and angry God who is out to get us, or more hopefully them, because we, and definitely they, are nothing more than naughty children who would benefit more from a lump of coal than something sweet being put in their stocking. But that flies in the face of the message of the good news and a God who cares so deeply for us that we would in fact receive the best gift there is. John says in this gospel today, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. That power is the most powerful thing ever known. A friend of mine posted these words on Facebook, when the power of love is greater than the love of power, the world will know peace. When the power of love is greater than the love of power, the world will know peace. We forget that God is more patient than we can imagine and keeps slowly, relentlessly working in us this message of love. And God is willing to wait for however long it takes. In Peter's letter from today, he writes, do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. We often notice only the second half of that statement, that the Lord can see a thousand years as if they were only one day. I think that's how we want God to see us, so that our inability to embrace God's power of love is obscured by our love of power, and thus the speed of time just flies by. God doesn't see it. But the first half of it suggests that sometimes God experiences time like little kids waiting for Christmas morning and wondering if it will ever come. When every day can seem like a thousand years, we are usually agonizing over something, waiting desperately for something. The weeks before us, waiting for the vaccine to be available, seem like a thousand years. They can't come soon enough. The last nine months behind us seem like a thousand years. 
The years of a lifetime fly by for the old and they plod along for the young. When things go so fast, we wish they would slow down so we could savor them, enjoy them, remember them. When they go so slow, we can suffer such pain, such agony, such longing. Time is such a funny thing. I wonder if God agonizes over us in the same way we agonize over things that we wait for. But what about those thousand years in a day that we have to get things figured out, to be forgiven, and to be forgiven again? What if God is not just agonizing for us, but also is okay to patiently wait a thousand years for us, for us? The author of a commentary I read said, what is it that God is waiting to unwrap? He clearly was thinking about Christmas morning and that best of presents, maybe in your family, the last present where everybody goes around with the room with the one last big gift. What is God waiting to unwrap? The context, this commentator says, makes it quite clear. God is waiting to unwrap the new you and the new heavens and the new earth. God is eagerly waiting to see you become all you were created to be and all that Jesus lived and died to enable you to be. If all of this seems like it's taking forever for us, I wonder how much longer it feels like to God who aches to see us all gather in peace. And this day waiting can feel like a thousand years. Maybe we have God all wrong. God is doing everything possible to prevent our self-destruction, hoping that every last one of us might at last run through a door that Jesus is holding open, run through a heaven that is not yet ready to close its doors. The end of things is not a day of vengeance as much as a day of welcome, of welcoming everyone home free, healed, forgiven, at peace. This is an advent I would want to be part of, a waiting of a coming that's coming. That's the beginning of the journey I would want to start on. I would want the path to be straight and easy. I would want the road signs and the line striping to make sense. Oftentimes, we are on rutted rural roads that take all kinds of twists and turns, and we end up lost and in desperate need of help. Perhaps one of those thousand days is to pull us back onto the main road. Maybe another question is, what are we waiting to unwrap? I am asking myself, what do I want to hear in these readings this morning? How do I prepare? How do I hope for peace on this second Sunday of Advent? Pop back up to Mark's first words. This is just the beginning. We don't have to figure it out all day, all day, every day. We don't have to figure it out today. The door is still open. The opportunity and the days are still before us. Maybe time is not running out, as some of our doomsday brothers and sisters suggest, but that God is patient, even when we are not. God can wait and wait and wait. Our time is not God's time, and that is probably very good. We may look around at all that is going on today and wish this journey would hurry up because there is so much wrong and hurtful and unjust. There are so many hungry and naked and hurting people. There is so much violence and brutality. There are so many isms that reek of inequality. Waiting on God's timing isn't easy for us either. Unless it is we who need to get ready and a patient God is still opening up a door for us for us to walk through, 
at the end of a road that is straight and flat and not necessarily all that narrow, but narrow enough to keep us in line on the way, towards the way. My prayer is for us to say, come Christ, come now, but wait for us. I am coming. We are all coming because Jesus lived and died and rose again with enough power to love us, to wait for us, but to hurry us along and enable us to get there in time. Amen.